Hey there, my name is Nathan Bryan, and I wanted to spend the next hour with you, updating you on really 20 years of research and taking you through a journey of discovery to the development of safe and effective nitric oxide-based uh, therapeutics. So for the past 20 years, I've been involved in nitric oxide research, and really my research lab has been involved in asking just four fundamental questions. Number one, how does the human body produce nitric oxide? What goes wrong in people that can't make nitric oxide? And then what are the clinical consequences of insufficient nitric oxide production? And then perhaps most importantly, how do you fix or restore endogenous nitric oxide production? And through that 20 year uh, journey, I've been uh, made several important discoveries. I have dozens of issued US and international patents on nitric oxide technology. Uh, over 100 peer reviewed published papers on nitric oxide biochemistry and physiology. I've delivered over 200 lectures worldwide trying to educate consumers and physicians and healthcare practitioners on the importance of nitric oxide. So I thought it was prudent at this juncture to really kind of package all this up and take you through this journey to give you some really what I think is probably some of the most important information uh, that perhaps you didn't know. I have a number of conflicts of interest that I'm required to share with you. I'm a founder and shareholder of a company called Human to the Power of N. The founder and CEO of Nitric Oxide Innovations, Lumen Nitric Oxide, shareholder in Sage Pharma, shareholder in Derma Shower, and then I receive royalties from my patents from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. So what I thought we would do is just focus really on four primary objectives, going back to what we've been trying to achieve over the past 20 years. But teach you how nitric oxide is produced in the human body, what goes wrong in people that can't make nitric oxide, how this contributes to chronic disease, uh, share with you the clinical symptoms that are manifestations of systemic disease. So if you or you have patients that are presenting with some unrelated multi-system, multi-organ disease, then you can begin to think about nitric oxide. And then I'll wrap it up with showing you evidence-based therapeutic and nutritional strategies to restore nitric oxide production in your patients to improve systemic health. And this has been my guiding principle for the past 20 years, is to see what everyone else has seen but to think what no one else has thought. And that's really the true goal of research. And in the nitric oxide field, it's been very difficult because there's 170,000 published scientific papers. So sometimes it's very difficult uh, to see through the noise and to think a little bit outside the box. But I wanna start with this really simplified theory of disease. And in my 20 years of research in biomedical sciences, is that disease is caused by two things and two things only. Number one, the body's exposed to a toxin that interrupts normal cellular function. Or number two, the body's missing an essential nutrient that disrupts normal cellular function. But mechanistically, the end result is disruption of nitric oxide production, decreased circulation and blood flow, increased inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. It's hallmark of every single human chronic disease. And we can, we can actually visualize this through spec scans, and this is from Dr. Amon's clinic. And spec scans are really visual uh, tools, imaging tools, that you can really determine the amount of blood flow related to any organ. And these are particularly uh, spec scans of brains. And so you can see on the left, a healthy brain, you have nice, uh, good blood flow. Uh, there's homogenous perfusion of the brain. And then if you take an unhealthy brain on the right, and this could be someone with substance or alcohol abuse. This can be a Parkinson's patient, Alzheimer's, uh, bipolar, schizophrenia. But what you see is a perturbation in the perfusion of certain regions of the brain. So this tells us that really whether it's the brain or the heart or the lungs or the kidney or the sex organs, if you have decreased regulation of blood flow, then these cells and organs, the tissues start to become dysfunctional. <clears throat> We also know from many decades of research that every single chronic disease is characterized by decreased blood flow to the affected organ. But it's also appreciated if you can restore blood flow and get oxygen and nutrients to those specific regions of the body, you can correct many of these chronic conditions. So obviously the very important question we asked was how do you restore blood flow and perfusion to all organs, tissues, and cells throughout the body? Can you do that through this molecule nitric oxide? And this was the front page of the New York Times the day the, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 1998 for the discovery of nitric oxide by Val Pfister, who was then president of the American Heart Association. 
And he was cited as saying the discovery of nitric oxide and its function is one of the most important in the history of cardiovascular medicine. And over 20 years later, that, that quote still stands true. And I'll take you through some really some fundamental uh, discoveries that really changed the way we thought about nitric oxide. So for years, we thought nitric oxide was just a simple vasodilator, meaning that it opened up blood vessels, uh, improved oxygen and, and blood flow and nutrient delivery. But this study here by Jonathan Stammer back in 2015 showed that nitric oxide is really what it is, a signaling molecule. But it, the signaling aspect is far more important than we could ever realize because nitric oxide binds to hemoglobin in the red blood cells that carry oxygen. And it's this nitric oxide binding that allows for the oxygen exchange in the periphery. So without nitric oxide bound to the cysteine residue of hemoglobin, that oxygen does not come off. It basically prevents this allosteric delivery of oxygen in the periphery. So this is very important in critical care medicine because if you give patients 100% oxygen, you can improve their O2 sets to say normal 98, 99%, but yet they're systemically hypoxic because without that functionality of the nitric oxide, the oxygen doesn't come off. So to correct for not just perfusion or any ischemic disease or hypoxic disease, you have to fix nitric oxide-based signaling in hemoglobin to not only get the blood flow there, but to actually deliver the oxygen from the hemoglobin in red blood cells. And it's far more important than that. As I mentioned, 170,000 papers published in the nitric oxide literature. It's involved in maintaining the integrity of the cardiovascular system, the peripheral nervous system. It's the molecule responsible for uh, regeneration, stem cell mobilization and differentiation of how our body heals. It's a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. And it's the molecule responsible for uh, sexual function in both men and women. And then really an underappreciated aspect of nitric oxide is an immunology. It's how our immune system fights off invading pathogens. Today, we're living through this COVID-19 pandemic and it's apparent to the medical and scientific community that patients who become nitric oxide deficient not only are more susceptible to viral infection, but the severity of disease is greatly enhanced. The need for ventilation is greater and these patients with underlying symptoms of nitric oxide deficiency have a 10 time higher mortality from COVID infection. So it appears that it's very clear that nitric oxide should be a very important consideration, in not only the treatment of COVID-19 patients, but also in the prevention of not just from coronavirus, but for even the seasonal influenza. And the Nobel Prize, as I mentioned, was awarded in 1998 to these three US scientists. And it was Fred Murad who discovered that drugs like nitroglycerin work because they are metabolized into nitric oxide that then dilate the coronary arteries and you get uh, this symptomatic relief of acute angina or the pain associated with ischemic heart disease. Then in 1980, Bob Ferchcott discovered that our endothelial cells makes the substance that causes these blood vessels to relax. And he turned this endothelium-derived relaxing factor, EDRF. And then in 1987, Lou Ignaro discovered that EDRF is nitric oxide. So if you give an exogenous NO donor or stimulate endogenous nitric oxide production, it causes vasodilation and increase in perfusion, oxygen delivery to all cells in the body. And it was uh, Dr. Murat who recruited me to join the faculty of UT Medical School in Houston uh, many years ago, and Lou Ignaro has written forward to several of my textbooks. So you may ask yourself, who needs nitric oxide? Who's a candidate for nitric oxide-based uh, interventions or therapy? Now, hopefully by the end of this, I'll convince you it's anybody who's aging, certainly anyone over the age of 40, anyone with circulatory issues, diabetics, people with low energy, mitochondrial dysfunction, people with sexual dysfunction, and even drug and lifestyle uh, habits inter interrupt nitric oxide production. So antacids, proton pump inhibitors. Um, but I think the biggest effect we can have is being proactive. So if you're interested in disease prevention, you, know, you absolutely have to prevent the fall and decline in nitric oxide production. Certainly anybody with a chronic disease, anybody diagnosed with vascular dysfunction. So if we go back to the very basics, and I like this quote from the 1600s, that a man is as old as his arteries. And we can appreciate that because we know through years of research that the older you get, that your blood vessels become a little bit uh, stiff, you get plaque and, plaque and fat deposition, 
uh, under the lining of the blood vessel. Over time, this plaque becomes unstable, it ruptures, and that's the number one killer of men and women worldwide as it relates to cardiovascular disease. We also know that the functional loss of nitric oxide production in the vascular endothelium precedes these structural changes by many years, sometimes decades. So when you lose the ability to make nitric oxide, it really sets the stage for fat deposition, inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction that occurs in cardiovascular disease. It's also appreciated that if you can prevent the loss of nitric oxide production, you can prevent this whole progression of cardiovascular disease. And I'll take you through the mechanisms and the cellular and molecular biology of how that happens. So if nitric oxide is so important, which we know it is, then the fundamental question we ask was how do you control and regulate nitric oxide production? So it appeared to us if you understand how nitric oxide is produced in the body, and then you begin to recognize what goes wrong in these patients that can't make it, <clears throat> then you're armed with the information and the, and the tools you need to restore the functionality of this in individual patients. And I won't go into the detail, but there's two pathways to make nitric oxide. The first one is through an arginine pathway, and this is through an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase, or NOS. The other is through a dietary pathway, which makes for an interesting interventional uh, strategy. The nit inorganic nitrate found in green leafy vegetables can be metabolized into nitride and nitric oxide. So each pathway provides about 50%. One can compensate for the other, but when you have endothelial dysfunction, which means that you've lost the ability to convert arginine to nitric oxide, and you have a poor diet or mouthwash use, PPI use, and you shut down this other pathway, then bad things begin to happen and symptoms set in and disease progresses and advances really rapidly. If you look at just the first pathway, this is the NOS pathway for endothelial dysfunction. So the older we get, the less nitric oxide we make through the nitric oxide synthase, meaning that the older you get, the less efficient you become at converting arginine into nitric oxide. Now this is important because there's a number of nitric oxide products on the market that have L-arginine. So you never lose the, uh, the, you never become deficient in arginine, you just lose the ability to convert it to nitric oxide. So what these four independent studies show that, you know, by the time you're 40 years old, you only have about 50% of the nitric oxide you had when you were young. So it's, we thought, well, if you can prevent the age-related decline in nitric oxide production, can you prevent age-related disease? And the answer is yes, and I'll take you through that. So when you become deficient in nitric oxide, or you lose the ability to produce nitric oxide through either pathway, uh, these are the clinical consequences. You develop high blood pressure, you develop sexual dysfunction, vascular dementia, Alzheimer's, diabetes, peripheral artery disease, small vessel disease, things like Raynaud's syndrome, atherosclerosis, blood clotting disorders, acute respiratory distress syndrome, heart failure, kidney injury, immune dysfunction, again, susceptibility to infections. So it appears to me that every single human chronic disease, the things that really drain the healthcare system uh, in the economy is related to the treatment of chronic disease. And all of these are due to insufficient nitric oxide production. So if you can just fix this one thing, nitric oxide production in the human body, you can basically affect and control and better manage every single one of these chronic diseases. And I'll just take you through a couple of very simple uh, concepts. That this is the single layer of endothelial cells. This is the smooth muscle that surrounds all blood vessels in the body. And this would be the, the pink part would be kind of the lumen of the blood vessel where the blood is. And when you can activate this through shear stress or exercise that turns this enzyme on, if you have normal endothelial function, then this enzyme is coupled, NOS enzyme is coupled, and it can generate nitric oxide. Well, then this nitric oxide that's produced diffuses into this underlying smooth muscle. With it being a gas, it can diffuse in all three dimensions. And it activates an enzyme called guanylyl cyclase. And this enzyme produces a second messenger called cyclic GMP. And this is the site of action of the mechanism for drugs like Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra that are approved for the treatment of erectile dysfunction. So, Nitric oxide turns this switch on, but then these PD-5 inhibitors like Viagra keep the switch on. That's the reason you're warned against four-hour erections, and it's the reason there's all these really pretty serious side effects. But the important observation over the past 10 years is only about 50% of the men that are prescribed these erectile dysfunction drugs respond 
with better erections. And so that tells us that really the erectile dysfunction seen in both men and women is a condition of insufficient nitric oxide production. Because if you can't make nitric oxide here, there's no cyclic GMP to really provide a target for this type of therapy. So we now know that if you can restore nitric oxide production at the level of the endothelium, you can make non-responders to PD-5 inhibition therapy responders and actually start to decrease the dose, mitigate the risk of high dose PD-5 inhibition therapy. So then we started to ask kind of better questions perhaps. Can, can you use nutrition, food, and supplements to provide nitric oxide support? And this came from the idea, or really the fundamental principles, that the air we breathe is that 78% nitrogen. So nitrogen in the air is fixed by lightning fixation uh, or these nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live in the soil. So any vegetables that we eat that are grown in the soil have a source of nitrate or nitrite or these nitrogen oxides. And when we consume them in the body, it's exposed to these nitrogen oxides, primarily in the form of nitrate. And then there's a human nitrogen cycle. <clears throat> so when we eat, for instance, spinach or green leafy vegetables, it's known that the body takes up inorganic nitrate, concentrates it in our salivary glands, and then there are bacteria that live in the crypts of the tongue, on the back part, dorsal part of the tongue, that metabolize nitrate into nitrite. And then so our saliva becomes concentrated in nitrite, provided we have the right oral bacteria. And then when we swallow our own saliva, the pKa of nitride is 3.4, meaning that at that pH, it becomes protonated and generate and forms nitric oxide. So when we swallow our saliva, provided their stomach acid production, this nitride from our saliva is then formed into nitric oxide in the lumen of the stomach. And it's been shown that just swallowing our own saliva and having sufficient stomach acid production, you can inhibit gastric ulcerations from chronic NSAID use, you can kill uh, ulcer-causing bacteria, H. pylori, you increase gastric mucosal blood flow to enhance nutrient absorption. Uh, so this is a fundamental physiological pathway that's dependent upon, number one, a good diet, number two, sufficient stomach acid production, and number three, the presence of the right oral nitrate producing bacteria. So if you're using mouthwash, you disrupt this pathway. If you're using uh, an acid, you disrupt this pathway. Or if you're not eating enough green leafy vegetables, you become nitric oxide deficient and you're at risk for cardiovascular disease. And this is a very simple concept uh, led by Hippocrates uh, centuries ago, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So the question we ask is how much nitrate do you need and how, much, how many servings of vegetables would you need to eat to get sufficient inorganic nitrate to fuel and feed this pathway? <clears throat> if you look at the literature that shows about 300 to 400 milligrams of nitrate as a bolus, so in a single serving to see changes in blood pressure or improve their exercise capacity. But if you look at the standard American diet, the SAD diet, it's estimated that we only consume about 150 milligrams of nitrate per day, and that's over two to three meals. So just as where many people are deficient in things like magnesium, chromium, selenium, um, iodine, all these essential nutrients, we become deficient in nitrate because of our dietary patterns. And if you look from a broader perspective, if you look at just dietary patterns, so the Japanese diet, which is the, probably one of the healthiest diets out there, and these people live the longest, if you look at their daily nitrate intake, it far exceeds any other kind of uh, ethnic diet. And if you look at the DASH diet, which is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, which is proven to lower blood pressure, uh, certain selections of, of certain foods and vegetables, you can get a nitrate intake that far exceeds any other uh, dietary pattern. So this told us that if you choose the right foods, then perhaps this provides a protective effect of certain foods or dietary patterns that hasn't been explained before. Then the next question was, okay, how much celery or broccoli or spinach would I need to eat to get sufficient nitrate to better manage blood pressure or to improve exercise performance? And so this study was in collaboration with Texas A&M. We went to five different cities across the U.S. and got vegetables off the shelf, brought them back to the lab, and measured the nitrate content. And we published this back in 2014 or 2015. But th these were the data, and this was quite shocking. So let's just take celery, for example, in this study. So we took celery from Los Angeles and Dallas, which had the highest nitrate 
come to. So if you lived in Dallas or Los Angeles, you could go to a retail grocer and buy celery off the shelf. And you could eat six or seven stalks of the celery. And you would get sufficient nitrate that if your body could metabolize it, it would be sufficient to lower your blood pressure and improve exercise. However, if you lived in New York, you would have to eat dozens of stalks of celery to get that because you can see here, there's orders of magnitude different between the nitrate content of the same celery <clears throat> from the same retail grocery in New York as it is in Los Angeles or Dallas. And this is consistent through the vegetable category. So there's a high variability, not just from one vegetable to the next, but from one city to the next. So this told us there's really no way we can make dietary recommendations because it depends on where you live. The dietary requirements if you live in Dallas will be much different than if you live in New York. And this is based on farming practices, probably freshness as well. We're finding that the nitrate, nitrate content of vegetables is really an indication of freshness. <clears throat> so that created a problem. The second problem, if we begin to really delve into the individual mechanisms, we know that nitrate is inert in humans. Nitrate must be reduced to nitrite by the commensal bacteria because humans don't have this enzyme. So there's additional problems because 200 million Americans wake up every day and use mouthwash, kills the oral bacteria. Two, over 200 million Americans are using antacids, things like pilosec, prevacid, these proton pump inhibitors. That disrupts this pathway. And over 200 million prescriptions are written for antibiotics every day. So that tells us that the majority of Americans aren't able to utilize nitrate from the diet or even through supplementing through some beet root products or, or dietary supplements. So plant-based diets or potassium nitrate-based products will only work in less than a third of Americans due to these known statistics of mouthwash, antacid, and antibiotic. This is a very important study back from 2013 that and this demonstrates that if you use mouthwash, your blood pressure goes up. And so these are normal tensive patients, patients with normal blood pressure that were given mouthwash twice a day for seven days. At the end of seven days, you can see that there's both salivary and plasma levels of nitrite decreased and their blood pressure goes up. And there was a very strong correlation between the loss of salivary nitrite and plasma nitrite in the increase in blood pressure. This told us the very first time that the oral commensal bacteria are involved in regulating systemic blood pressure. A very profound observation. So the use of mouthwash causes an increase in blood pressure and it abolishes the cardioprotective effects of exercise. This made sense to us because the bacteria that live in and on our body provide about 3 million gene products, whereas the human genome is only about 23,000 gene products. These bacteria that live in and on the body are designed to do things that we as humans can't do. So we call this a symbiotic relationship. So these bugs benefit and the human organism benefits from these commensal bacteria. So we began a study in the Texas Medical Center uh, doing tongue scrapings with people in the Texas Medical Center, an IRB approved study, to determine if we could culture certain nitrate reducing bacteria and to see if this correlated with overall health or, or blood pressure. So they're denitrifying bacteria that reduce nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide all the way down to elemental nitrogen and ammonia. So we were interested in determining what are the nitrate reducing bacteria, what are the nitrite reducing bacteria, and to really get a sense of what bacteria are responsible for the maintenance of normal blood pressure. We published this in 2014, it seemed to be an association between those that had the best ability to reduce nitrate and kind of normal blood pressure compared to those patients who couldn't reduce nitrate. They had a completely different community and oral microbiome than those that were good to call nitrate reducers. <clears throat> and then we followed that study up with a more kind of a detailed controlled study by taking normal intensive healthy individuals and giving them mouthwash twice a day for seven days and then looking at how this changed the oral microbiome and what effect this had on their blood pressure. And this was, this again, this paper was published uh, last year, but this is just one example of one patient. So one week mouthwash use in one patient caused a 26 millimeter increase in their blood pressure. 
So meaning that nothing changed. It's a 21 year old dental student, very healthy, good diet, physically active, and nothing more than giving him mouthwash for one week, his blood pressure went up 26 millimeters of mercury, making him clinically hypertensive. And we were able to determine and identify certain bacteria that disappeared when his blood pressure went up and certain bacteria that reappeared when his blood pressure began to normalize. And this was kind of our, our take home slide here that we could predict steady state blood pressure by the presence and number of these four bacteria. So we think these may be uh, really indicators of normal blood pressure. And there's this phenomenon called resistant hypertension, meaning that these patients are resistant to standard antihypertensive medications. And this may explain resistant hypertension because part of the hypertensive response may be a symptom of oral dysbiosis and mouthwash use or oral infection, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. And so what happens is the bad bacteria begin to uh, disrupt the good communities, the nitrate reducing bacteria, and it affects nitrite, nitric oxide production, and blood pressure goes up as expected. Let me focus on diabetes just for a second because it's, uh, it's a worldwide epidemic now. We've known for many years that diabetes causes uh, increased cardiovascular disease severity. And there's a known mechanism for this because once you get diabetes, you get oxidative stress, you get these advanced glycosylation end products, uh, hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, and all this shuts down the nitric oxide synthase production of nitric, uh, nitric oxide. But this study showed that if you knock out the gene that produces nitric oxide in mice, the first thing they develop is type 2 insulin-resistant diabetes. So this suggested to us that if you, if you become compromised in your ability to generate nitric oxide, you disrupt insulin signaling, you become insulin-resistant, and then this further leads to a downregulation and you know, in insufficient production of nitric oxide, and then you get with a type 2 insulin-resistant diabetes. And that's this perpetual cycle, and it really explains why these patients are poorly managed, because no one has focused, no therapeutic for diabetics has been focused on restoring the production of nitric oxide. And we, we mapped this out, and this is how insulin signaling works. It binds to an insulin receptor, activates a number of second messengers, protein kinases, that really converge on nitric oxide synthase. So you can post translationally modify certain residues on ENOS and that activates the enzyme. Uh, so whether it's AMP kinase, the target of uh, metformin, or AKT PI3 uh, kinase, uh, it basically turns to, turn, acts to turn on nitric oxide production. But in diabetes, we know that there's an uncoupled nitric oxide synthase enzyme, so it doesn't produce nitric oxide. So once you, we, that's where the pathway ended here. So if you have diabetes, we knew that they didn't make nitric oxide. So then what happens to glucose uptake? What we found was, and we published this in 2014, that there's two cysteine residues on the GLUT4, and that's the protein that's primarily intracellular, but when it's activated, it goes to the membrane and, and binds glucose and brings it in. But in order for GLUT4 to work, you have to post translationally modify the cysteine residues, which is necessary and sufficient for GLUT4 translocation. So if you restore nitric oxide production in diabetics, you restore the functionality of GLUT4, you increase glucose uptake, and you basically can restore normal insulin signal. And then this was an interesting part of our discovery, was looking at traditional Chinese medicines that have been used for a number of years, centuries, in the treatment of cardiovascular disease. And so we began to look at certain drugs or herbs in the, in the Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese medicine that were directly related to or used as treatments for cardiovascular disease. And we got a mortar and pestle, we ground these up, we put them in our nitric oxide analyzer. And what we found was quite shocking. So some herbs, there wasn't really hardly any nitric oxide. So this graph actually measures free nitric oxide gas, for the gas phase nitric oxide analyzer. And so some we would put in, you would start to see some nitric oxide release with a very predictable NO release. And then you take the, the herb out, the nitric oxide goes down. And you put another extract in, you get this burst of NO with a very steady nitric oxide release profile. And then if we add these two uh, extracts together, you actually get a synergistic effect <clears throat> of nitric oxide. So you would think there's an additive effect here. So one plus one equals two. In the case of traditional Chinese medicine, 
this synergistic effect that's been explained for thousands of years, one plus one equals 10. So we can actually describe the synergistic effects of traditional Chinese medicines by their ability to generate nitric oxide gas. So this was exciting because the, we could actually dial in any level of nitric oxide we wanted based on how we combine these certain herbal extracts. So understanding that everybody has a different oral microbiome, everybody has a different diet, how do you overcome the variability in the nitrate reduction based on differences in the oral microbiome? And so we go back to a very well-established model that the beginning stages of vascular disease or atherosclerosis is when your endothelial cells become sticky or almost like Velcro, where monocytes and T-cells and neutrophils begin to stick to the lining of the blood vessel. They migrate through, and this is the early stages of vascular inflammation where we get immune dysfunction, oxidative stress, and inflammation that's associated with the hallmarks of cardiovascular disease. But it's also known that if you can prevent or inhibit this monocyte rolling and adhesion, you can prevent the onset and progression of vascular disease. This video here is real-time intravital microscopy of a really an inflammatory diet. And you can see here, this is a single blood vessel vascular bed where monocytes and neutrophils are sticking to the lining of the blood vessel. There's a little bit of blood flow getting through here, but hopefully you can appreciate that this is a heightened state of vascular inflammation. Not a very good situation. <clears throat> but if we take that same inflammatory diet, atherogenic diet, and we fix these nitric oxide production pathways, you can see here, this is the same vascular bed, but we've restored nitric oxide production. The blood vessel is more dilated, the monocytes and neutrophils home along the endothelium looking for sites of injury, but they don't stick and they don't migrate. So you can completely suppress the inflammatory response to a poor diet by restoring the production of nitric oxide. Now, what about genetic testing? We're living in this whole uh, era of uh, genomics. We're beginning to understand how these different uh, pathways feed into the nitric oxide pathway. The one I want to focus on is the MTHFR, or the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase <clears throat> gene, because this is very important. It's estimated that about 50% of Americans have this single nucleotide polymorphism in the MTHFR. So what might not be apparent is that the MTHFR is what's responsible for reducing biopterin, or BH2, to tetrahydrobiopterin. And it's the availability of tetrahydrobiopterin it's the rate limiting step in nitric oxide production. So if you or if you have a patient with MTHFR SNP, then by definition, these patients become nitric oxide deficient because they're unable to, to maintain a proper redox balance of BH4 to BH2 to maintain normal nitric oxide production. So understanding all that, this was a 10 year journey and then we had information that we could, okay, now that we understand how the human body makes nitric oxide, we understand what goes wrong with people that can't make it, now we can fix it. So our, our kind of milestones and objectives were to provide an exogenous source of NO. So if your body can't make nitric oxide, then we have to do it for you. We have to rescue that until we can actually fix the reason your body can't make it. And this is technology we developed, uh, I guess, over 10 years ago in an orally disintegrating tablet. That if you put the lozenge in your mouth, and you put a nitric oxide analyzer in there, you can see that it releases nitric oxide. So clear, verifiable, quantifiable nitric oxide release. There's no other technology in the world that does this. We get peak plasma concentrations within 20 minutes. This was a, a double-blind placebo-controlled uh, study out of the Hypertension Institute in Nashville. And you can see here that if we take patients with an elevation in blood pressure, give them one lozenge, within 20 minutes, both their systolic and diastolic pressures become significantly lower. 60 minutes later, there's a further significant reduction, reduction in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure where a placebo had no effect. In looking at <clears throat> what's called flow mediated dilatation or endothelial function, we see four hours later that a 15 to 20% improvement in endothelial function. This demonstrates that we've recoupled the nitric oxide synthase enzyme and basically improved the body's own ability to make nitric oxide. So again, provide an exogenous source of NO, which we do through the lozenge that's bioactive because we can see a reduction in blood pressure within 20 minutes, but fixing the underlying problem of endothelial dysfunction. And just to show that it's bioactive, that 10 minutes after the lozenge is placed in the mouth, we see a 
13% increase in blood vessel diameter. And this is in the carotid artery of the neck. And this 13% increase in blood vessel diameter causes a 34% increase in blood flow. So if you remember back from how I started the, the lecture, that decreased blood flow, spec scans of the brain show uh, inability to perfuse certain regions of the brain. So if we're increasing the blood flow to the brain by 34% within 10 minutes, you can imagine that the spec scan will improve, cognition improves, neurological disease improves simply by restoration of the blood flow. And this was a study by Ernst Schwartz at, um, in Los Angeles, taking pre-hypertensive patients, a double-blind placebo-controlled uh, study. And in 30 days, we took pre-hypertensive patients and made them normal tensive by giving them one lozenge twice a day. In fact, 30 days later, we saw a 12 millimeter reduction in systolic pressure, six millimeter reduction in diastolic, highly significant reduction. Placebo, there was no effect. No change in heart rate. The six minute walk test, the patients on the nitric oxide lozenge were able to walk significantly further, demonstrating a functional improvement of the heart, uh, placebo no effect, and the quality of life questionnaire, both the physical and mental composite score, those taking the lozenge showed a significant improvement in quality of life uh, parameters. This is some cool uh, kind of imagery using thermography. This is a 49-year-old female chronic smoker with uh, Raynaud's syndrome. That's a microvascular disease characterized by cold hands, cold feet. And you can see 10 minutes after taking the lozenge, we open up the small vessels, perfuse the digits, um, and most importantly, simply you get complete symptomatic relief of the Raynaud's and the pain and coldness associated with this disorder. And this was a study by Ed Lee, an endocrinologist in, in Florida, that took patients that had stable carotid plaque for the previous three years and did nothing more but to put them on the lozenge, one lozenge twice a day for six months. And for six months, came back and observed that their plaque, carotid plaque, had decreased by 11%. So 11% plaque regression in six months. Very impressive results. And then I'll take you through um, really a very important and probably the most gratifying thing I've done in collaboration with some physicians at Texas Children's Hospital. There's a group of patients born with a condition called arginous succinic acid urea. It's a urea cycle disorder. These patients are born without an ASL enzyme. This is the enzyme responsible for, along with arginous succinic synthase, converting citrulline into arginine. And so without this enzyme, you get a buildup of arginous succinic acid, and that's the basis for the diagnosis. So an underlying inborn air metabolism, urea cycle disorder, their primary clinical presentation is hyperammonemia, but the physicians noticed a number of collateral uh, symptoms seemingly unrelated to the underlying hyperammonemia and the neurological uh, urea cycle disorder. They have liver dysfunction and cirrhosis, blood clotting disorders, neurological dysfunction that appear to be independent of the recurrent hyperammonemia, resistant hypertension, and then kidney disease. And the question was, was this more than hyperammonemia? And so in collaboration with them, we published this in Nature Medicine in 2011, but we discovered a new protein complex and really a higher sophistication of regulation of nitric oxide. It's the ASL enzyme that tethers the ENOS enzyme to the membrane. And then this protein complex really provides a sophisticated way of intramolecular shuttling of substrate. So arginine comes in, shuttle through the ENOS enzyme to get nitric oxide provided the enzyme is functional. Then you get citrulline as a byproduct. And then the citrulline is shuttled through ASS and ASL enzyme to generate arginine. And then it's the arginine that comes from citrulline through the urea cycle that goes to make nitric oxide. And so you get regulated both spatial and temporal control and regulation of these substrate shuttling to make nitric oxide. And so it became apparent that if you don't have ASL, as in these patients, this protein complex falls apart, and it's probably the best genetic model for complete nitric oxide deficiency. And clinically, if you look at the blood pressure profile, at five years of age, this was a single patient <clears throat> that was diagnosed. You see, for 10 years, his blood pressure was very poorly managed, even on standard pharmacotherapy. And in February of 2010, I believe he presented to Texas Children's Hospital the intensive care unit and hypertensive crisis. 
Uh, we realized then it was a nitric oxide related problem. Uh, physicians decided to dose him with isozorbide, which is organic nitrate, it generates nitric oxide. Blood pressure was very well managed for a couple of months and then he started developing tolerance to organic nitrate therapy, which is standard. And then uh, came back to Texas Children's, taking 20 milligrams four times a day, I believe. And then we put him on the nitric oxide lozenge. His blood pressure normalized, I believe, within four hours. So we can completely overcome the, the non responsive or the resistant to standard antihypertensive drugs as well as organic nitrates simply by utilizing the technology we developed to give the body an exogenous source of NO that's not involved in tolerance development as well as trying to fix the underlying uh, nitric oxide production pathways. Within five months after starting the nitric oxide therapy, his uh, heart disease had completely normalized. This correlated with an increased number of circulating individual progenitor cells, uh, and his kidney disease uh, resolved within, I think, two to three weeks. We stopped spilling protein in the urine. So very important uh, clinical observations with uh, this restoring the production of microtoxin. <clears throat> and I'll take you through kind of some non-invasive measures of vascular dysfunction. This is a three-minute test that's really looking at structure and function of blood vessels. Uh, you're looking for type 1 and type 2 blood vessels, which means that the vessels are soft and compliant with no plaque. Or when you start to get into type 4, type 5, type 6 blood vessels, these are stiff arteries, a lot of plaque built up, and they become non-responsive and non-compliant. It tells us that you have advanced vascular disease. And so if you just take these patients now, and this is a 74-year-old female that had type 5 blood vessels. 90 days later, with the nitric oxide lozenge, we turn her into type 1 blood vessels. So in three months, basically corroborating study the observations by Ed Lee, that you can change the vascular structure and function by restoring nitric oxide production. Here's another patient, type 4 to type 2 in 60 days. 60-year-old um, male, type 4 to type 2 in 60 days. It's a really some uh, really important observations clinically on non-invasive measures of endothelial function that show without a doubt that if you restore nitric oxide production, primarily through this nitric oxide lozenge, then you can basically uh, prevent and reverse vascular disease. The next little project was on mechanisms of nitric oxide. It's anti-aging. It's known that, you need, again, go back to the very first concept, that you need blood flow to the uh, small blood vessels of the skin in order for the cells of the dermis and epidermis to do their job to turn over uh, to produce collagen. Uh, but it's also known that if you have reduced blood flow to the skin, <clears throat> that you lose hydration, uh, you develop the signs of aging, the skin texture, elasticity, and thickness, and all the things associated with aging begin to advance. And so I developed a nitric oxide topical serum that, again, if your body can't make nitric oxide, then we do it for you, and then we fix the reason your body can't. And so this is a dual chamber uh, delivery that if you could combine the one contents of each chamber, mix it together, it generates nitric oxide gas, and you apply it to the face. You can see here 30 days before and afters, the age spots uh, go away. You can see here the, what we call the turkey neck. This is 30 days. <clears throat> the redness, the fine lines and wrinkles uh, really become much improved after 30 days. And again, these are just before and afters. Very effective at uh, wound healing. Uh, this was, I think, 10 days of just applying the serum to a really almost full thickness wound here and you get complete closure within 10 days. Uh, any type of inflammatory skin disease here, you can see uh, very effective in uh, changing uh, acne spots. And again, this is a 13 year old, uh, this is three day use. And it's independent of skin tone and texture, so even in in patients with uh, darker skin, um, you get the same effect. So uh, nitric oxide is really agnostic to the skin type. The underlying physiology is exactly the same. So let me take you through some case studies here because I think it's very important to understand that nitric oxide is critically important, but it's not a silver bullet, it's not an end-all, be-all, cure-all, because you have to address other issues 
in some sometimes very complicated patients. But if we go back to that concept that chronic disease is caused by a nutrient deficiency or an exposure to a toxin, and if you eliminate the toxins, which you can do through restorative dentistry, getting rid of infected root canals or oral infections, or eliminating you know, fat-soluble toxins like herbicides, pesticides, or even organic chemicals, you can apply voltage, restore nitric oxide both topically and systemically, and then apply good nutrition, give back, give the body what it needs. And the first one is my dad here, who's been in a wheelchair since 1984 from a car accident. Uh, here he is leaving the hospital from, uh, I'll take you through this case, but uh, he had a hemorrhoidectomy surgery uh, was probably seven or eight years ago. And then his surgeon told him to go home and sit on the heating pad for 30 minutes at a time, three times a day. And I think this was very poor advice because my dad's a paraplegic diabetic. When you hit a sit on a heating pad for 30 minutes, you get full thickness, third degree burns that was completely unaware to him because he has no feeling from T11, mid back, <clears throat> all the way down. So this was a very severe injury, as you may imagine, uh, prone to infection due to the location of this very poor prognosis given the number of comorbidities my dad had. And so he was in the hospital for a number of weeks, uh, again, poor prognosis. So at night, I began developing a topical nitric oxide uh, gauze that would cover this to get blood supply, to grow new blood vessels, to the skin graft. And the surgeon said it would take six to nine months for this to heal, if it healed at all. This was seven weeks later. We got the skin graft took, we got complete closure of this burn. Uh, the surgeons were amazed. And so that was really the impetus for me to understand topical nitric oxide is very important. Uh, not just for these chronic wounds, but probably applications beyond wounds. So that was a great success, but when they did the skin graft, my dad's prone to these pressure ulcers or the cubitus ulcers. And this was underneath his right butt cheek, the right ischial ulcer. And you can see here that I can put a tennis ball. Perhaps the, uh, it's difficult to, to see the, uh, the degree of or how big this wound is, but I can put a tennis ball in here and actually see all the way to the bone. So again, taking him to the best wound care docs that I knew of in the state of Texas, they said we could never heal this wound because he's paraplegic, diabetic, and a number of other uh, lifestyle habits that weren't um, congruent with getting this wound healed. So again, developed a nitric oxide release in gauze, applied the biomodulator. He had a number of uh, dental infections from infected root canals, and this was June 2014, and today we got complete closure of this wound, the wound that every wound care doc that I took him to said we would never heal. And so what did we do? We did a number of things. We took him to a, a restorative dentist and got his root canals cleaned up and all the oral infections, the metal taken out. I did ozone therapy, insufflated the wound with ozone. I did uh, infrared light therapy, infrared sauna, the biomodulator that from Jerry Tennant in Dallas, Texas that provides voltage to allow for wound healing. The topical nitric oxide, we actually did adipose derived stem cells and injected stem cells in and around the wound. And this here was sufficient to grow enough tissue to actually make him a candidate for a surgical flap. And so what really closed the wound ultimately was surgical flap since we've grown enough tissue. So again, nitric oxide was important in this particular uh, treatment protocol, but it wasn't the only thing we were doing. And then the next case was my nine-year-old son who had an ATV accident and almost degloved his right foot here. Obviously, a lot of damage, soft tissue, tendon, muscle damage. Uh, and by the time we got him to Texas Children's Hospital and we operated on him, this was probably about 24 or about 15 hours from the time the accident happened <clears throat> until um, got him in the operating room to reattach this flap. So this flap was without blood flow. Um, for many, many hours. So once we got it cleaned up, we uh, applied, again, the same principles here, the biomodulator, the topical nitric oxide, the biotransducer, again, this is a device from Jerry Tennant. And again, they thought this would take multiple surgeries, a lot of plastics and reconstructive surgery, perhaps loss of function. And six weeks later, five weeks later, this was the wound. Uh, primary closure from the original surgery, no plastics, no reconstruction, no loss of function. So again, very impressive results 
by applying these very simple principles for wound care. So what are the steps to treat chronic disease? Obviously these are acute kind of traumatic uh, injuries, but the principles are the same. So you give the body what it needs and it'll heal itself. You eliminate toxins. How do you do this? Remove infected root canals, use an infrared sauna to detox and then drink and bathe in clean water. Restore the production of nitric oxide and then apply good nutrition to restore missing nutrients. Then they apply the voltage to maintain cellular potential. You can do this through these devices. You can do this through grounding, walking barefoot outside on the grass or on the beach. Uh, but this goes back to basic biology of, and cellular biology of what the cell needs to, what the body needs to make a new cell that works properly. So going back to these fundamental questions, how do you improve nitric oxide production in patients to restore blood flow? And how do you discriminate the products that have been shown or other products that have been shown to increase blood flow in humans? The market is flooded with them and it's confusing to physicians, it's confusing to consumers. And so this is just, you know, it's almost humorous of some of the products out there that are marketed towards nitric oxide. But let me just provide you with some fundamental facts. That arginine is controlled by the enzymatic function of the NOS enzyme and not by L-arginine or citrulline deficiency. So taking a nitric oxide product that contains arginine or citrulline typically is not gonna do anything in terms of nitric oxide production. And nitrate utilization is controlled by the amount we consume, the presence or absence of these nitrate reducing bacteria, and stomach acid production. So nitrate bioactivity is similar to thyroid hormone. <clears throat> and I like this example because we know that T4 is an inactive hormone. It has to be metabolized into active hormone T3 or T2. So if you, if you have an inability to convert T4 to T3 for whatever reason, most of it's iodine deficiency, then T4 hormone is inactive. Well, nitrate acts like T4 because it, it's inert, it's inactive. It has to first be metabolized into nitrite or nitric oxide. So nitrate, just as T4, is inactive in humans. So products that contain inorganic nitrate or potassium nitrate, again, it's inert in humans. You're relying on the body's ability to convert it into active metabolites. And it's my argument that people are nitric oxide deficient because they've lost the ability to convert nitrate to nitric oxide. So there's certain steps in this process. So number one, if we don't eat enough green leafy vegetables, and it's even more than that, some of the green leafy vegetables we eat don't have enough nitrate in them. Uh, Problems with the nitrate uptake, that's a rare uh, disorder. But insufficient saliva production, patients with Sjogren's syndrome show symptoms of nitric oxide deficiency. Uh, mouthwash, very bad idea. If you're using mouthwash, you have to stop. It's very clear that this causes an increase in blood pressure, a number of other effects that really put you on the a slippery slope to developing advanced cardiovascular disease. Uh, 200 million users, again, overuse of antibiotics is a problem. And acids, over 200 million prescriptions written every year. That's not counting the over-the-counter purchases of, of antacids. I realize that acid reflux is a horrible problem, but these drugs, acid reducers, are causing significant problems. In fact, 35 people that have been on PPIs for three to five years have about a 30 to 35 percent higher risk and in incidence of heart attack and stroke. Very clear observations, very clear damage done by these drugs that come back to dealing with shutting down nitric oxide production. So what are some take home facts? Beets do not equal nitrate. Don't go to Whole Foods or someplace and just buy any beet product because most of these, 90% of them I've tested, don't contain any nitrate. So they'll turn your urine pink, your poop pink, but they do not, will not give you any benefit. Second, nitrate does not equal nitric oxide. So there are products on there that have standardized amount of nitrate, but if people are using antiseptics, antibiotics, PPIs, they lost the ability to convert nitrate into nitric oxide. You put these numbers together, there's 600 million potential. The U.S. population is 320 something million. Obviously, there's people using antiseptics, PPIs, so there's overlap here. But this tells us that the majority of the people will not respond to nitrate-based therapies. And then arginine citrulline products do not work in patients with empathy blood dysfunction. So what do you look for? Look for patents. Patents demonstrate that there's innovation and uniqueness. That this particular technology does something that no other technology does. That's how patents are issued. Look for published clinical trials in peer-reviewed journals on the actual product, not an ingredient. 
clinical trials are very expensive to conduct. Most dietary supplements will never put their, their companies will not put their dietary supplements to a clinical trial because it's very hard to hit on meaningful endpoints. Look for uh, license from a reputable university institution that demonstrate that research has been done or performed on the technology. And then I think, look, look, at, look at the inventor or the formulator of the product. Have they published in the nitric oxide field? Nitric oxide is a very complicated, complex uh, field and the biochemistry is complex. And so if I've been doing this for 20 years and look for if they've published in the nitric oxide field. I see people doing webinars and interviews all the time and I do a PubMed search and they've not published anything in the nitric oxide field. They're just a, a figurehead that really know nothing about nitric oxide. So don't be fooled by creative marketing. Science and experience matter. And let me just hammer home here. People get sick for two reasons. The body's missing something that it needs. The body's exposed to something toxic. It could be infected root canals. It could be chemicals, environmental, occupational. It could be EMFs. It could be 5G now. We know it's becoming very toxic. But the ultimate result is the loss of regulation of blood flow. And that, as I've just shared with you, leads to chronic disease. So you must replete the missing nutrients, apply good nutrition, detox the body. How do you do this? I recommend an infrared sauna, drink clean water, go see a good dentist to clean up any oral infections. And what I found is that is sufficient for taking some very sick, chronically ill patients and making them well. So I'll just conclude with, hopefully I've convinced you nitric oxide controls and regulates vascular structure and function. There's an age-related decline in nitric oxide production that asserts its effect on cardiovascular risk. In fact, all chronic disease Restoring nitric oxide production can lead to better vascular function, better perfusion of all tissue, which is needed for normal function, and strategies to restore no production from the stasis will have a profound impact on public health and on the aging process. And so any anti-aging strategy should include nitric oxide as a first line of defense. I'll leave you with a reference. Uh, this is my latest book, Functional Nitric Oxide Nutrition. It'll take you through really this whole um, in a 20 year journey and apply basic nutritional principles. I would uh, refer you to my website, drnathansbryan.com. This is an um, educational, informative uh, website. I'm not trying to sell you anything. There's a six minute video we created on here that'll basically tell you everything I've just told you in six minutes. Uh, then if anybody has any questions, there's my email. It may take me a couple days to respond, but I'll always respond to your emails. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I hope this has been informative. Uh, to me, there's nothing more important than educating the masses on what nitric oxide is, what it does, and why each of you should be concerned about your own nitric oxide production, because it is what determines whether you're uh, well or whether you're ill. So with that, I thank you very much again for your time, and I hope this has been informative.